Well, greetings and welcome to another road trip dividing line. I won't mention where I am. I'm just, uh, I'm, uh, let's see, one, two, I'm three days of driving, two stops. There we go. Uh, away from home. And tomorrow's going to be a long one. The next day is a fairly short one. And, um, and then we get home. So I left on the morning of the 6th. I'll get back. Uh, pretty much around the same time it'll be right at a month um and that'll be the longest uh longest road trip that we've done i'll just mention now um that we've learned a lot on this trip and if you have we probably if we were smart which highly questionable debatable thing these days um we probably could like do a a playlist and and then link it on the blog of all the stuff from each trip because the the difference in what's what's different in traveling the way that i'm traveling now aside from the speed and, you know, I can still have long delays too. It just it's due to a traffic accident or construction or something like that. Um, but the, the difference is obviously I get to go to churches that would otherwise, I would never even see that everyone in those churches would have to travel to some conference or something like that. So on this trip, you know, I went to a, pretty big conference, met lots of folks. Um, but I also went to a number of churches that otherwise I never would have, would have been in and hence met people, heard stories, uh, discovered a lot of the wonderful stuff that the ministry has done over the years, um, directly from people. It's, um, it's amazing. And so as we, you know, sort of look down the uh, corridors of time, um, we're, we're having to make some decisions as to the best way to do this because things are getting, things are getting tough and rough. And um, we are, we always have been a ministry supported by individuals not by, we've had, there's been about what, three times, I think, over the almost 40 years of Alpha Mega Ministries, where um, someone with real money came along. It was always short-lived and difficult and challenging because people with big money expect big attention. And we've just never been that kind of, you know, if you, if you support Alpha Mega Ministries because you believe in what we're doing, you believe in the dividing line, you believe in the debates, you, you believe in, in addressing the issues that we are addressing in the way that we address them, which, are, which is a pretty unique thing. And it, it's never been, you know, we've never had a, a donor list and, you know, how many, you know, the what levels people are giving at and how many calls they need to get, you know, over a certain number of weeks. To, we don't have enough. We only have two people anyways. So uh, we wouldn't be able to do what a lot of people do with all their maintenance of giving lists and stuff like that. So uh, as the economy um, falls apart around us, uh, we know that it's going to get tougher and tougher. And um, if I'm going to continue to get out at all, then we need to put ourselves in a situation right now where we've got everything we need and it's going to be long lasting where we only have maintenance costs basically. And so um, the fact is we did a really good job putting this, unit together the truck and the and the fifth wheel 
given that Rich and I knew nothing. I, I mean, I had I had ridden around in a in a big full contained RV unit for a couple days in Alaska once on one of those trips up there, <clears throat> that hunting hunting trip. Um, and that that was it. And Rich had pulled a truck, a, a, a boat, and had been in an RV one summer. But again, it was a completely contained thing. And so the only the only place we missed it, sort of, um, was the truck. The truck. I love the truck. Um, I, I really, really do. And it's done an amazing job. And it's in great shape. Um, we had our mechanic guy looked at it and he says, man, this is amazing because, and what's amazing about it is that it's, it, it's underpowered. It really is. We, we didn't know, uh, looked like it would be there. Make a long story short, um, you know, like today, it, it was a rough, it was a rough trip today. Um, when you're going back this direction, you're going, you're climbing up the continental divide. <laughs> And so it's generally up, not down. <clears throat> and um, it was very windy today. And that's where it's underpowered problem comes in. And so I had to stop three times for gas instead of once. I uh, unfortunately got about 7.6 miles to the gallon. I had gotten 12 most of the time going out because you're going downhill. Anyway, so um, we're making plans. We're, we're you know, want to try to put ourselves in a situation where I can continue to do this, um, even in a difficult, challenging future. Um, one of the issues is uh, this truck is a gas truck. And obviously, the one thing that's not going to disappear will be diesel. Um, the, the, the nation would collapse if that happened. Just to be honest, everything you eat, drink, everything else comes from a truck. So there will be emphasis on making sure that that continues to be available. Um, and uh, so we're, we're just trying to make it so that you get something that's just going to last, last, last. Because I, I'm only going to last so long, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. So we're making, we're just making plans. And uh, we'll let you mo know more about that in the, um, in the future. But just saying, on our way home, it's been great. It's been awesome to meet all you folks. Um, getting little things like my little P-52 back here. I tried to get that to stay up on the wall, and it absolutely refused to cooperate. So um, I got to put some more thought into that as to how I'm going to get that to stay back there. Right now, it's just sitting around. Uh, but meeting folks that the ministry and the dividing line has has touched and helped and benefited Um I love when folks say, I've been listening to you forever. And then it's, you know, it's been four years. Like that, you know, it's like, well, we started um, in the 1980s. And <clears throat> normally at that point, I'm talking to somebody who was born in the late 90s anyways. And so they sort of glaze over at that point. But um, it is, uh, it has been a real honor to uh, meet all those folks and, and, uh, and, and just see everything the Lord's done. Anyway, um, change gears here uh over the weekend interesting stuff took place on um, social media um i i haven't i tried to get some conversations going today while i was driving it didn't work out i'm gonna have one hopefully when i wrap up here uh one phone call a chat with with someone, uh, I won't go into that right now, but, and I'm not going to dive too much into uh, tweets that have been taken down, webcasts that have been taken down, but I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I think already corrections have been made. Some of the um, errors that were uh, included uh, regarding, for example, our board and things like that. I, I think it's already been put out there that there were simple factual errors that have been made. But what's really concerning me is, given that I'm driving, you probably are, are not 
overly uh, unhappy that I do not seek to participate <laughs> in uh, in social media while driving down the freeway. That's best for me, best for everybody around me. And so you sort of, you get a different perspective when you're not actually in it and you sort of have to back off of it. And you sort of have to do a summary type thing. You know, you see a summary of it, maybe, you know, I get to where I'm going and then you sort of scan through and see major themes. And it looks a little bit different than when you're actually sitting at your desk, you're working and stuff and you're sort of in it during the day. It's interesting how that works. And all of a sudden, what I'm seeing is, you know, post after post and video after video being produced about the evils of federal visionism. And I'm, I'm sitting back going, um, okay, uh, I, I, in back in 2001, I, uh, especially emphasized and focused on what was being said that specifically impacted the doctrine of justification and the nature of saving faith as a gift from God, uh, the you know, doctrine of election. And just to be honest, even though some people say you, you can, generally Baptists can't be federal visionists. I mean, you can try to you know, tweak things in some weird way. But, but the reality is um, that is a debate amongst Pado baptists who are seeking to define and defend a, a concept of covenant theology regarding the sacraments, really. And there were federal visionists who truly went well beyond the, well, they went into historical categories from the past century. I mean, this, this argument amongst Pado-Baptists is nothing new. It's just that it became concentrated there in 2001 um, but even then did not produce a unified movement. And that, that's really obvious because within just a few years, you've got a large amount of splintering. And so even at the Auburn Avenue thing, there were certain commonalities, commonalities but if you were listening carefully, it's, it's a little bit, very different topic, but it's a little bit like uh, at G3 a number of years ago, we did one on the Trinity before we started doing the uh, big, 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 big ones at the at the conference centers. We're still at Praise Mill. I think the, no, no, no. Yeah, I think it was, yes, yes. It still was at Praise Mill when we did the Trinity. And if you were listening carefully, and especially now, if you look backwards, you will see differences because Bruce Ware was there. I was there. And so my rather Warfieldian presentation would have um, would have as, as much differences in emphasis and direction as you could detect between Doug Wilson and some of the other people at the Auburn Avenue uh, conference and then who wrote afterwards and stuff like that. You could really, if you were listening, you could see that. And if you were to go back and listen today, you'd, you'd be able to pick up those, those differences. And yet we all got together and we all did our thing and nobody was trying to kick anybody out of the kingdom and stuff like that at that point in time, um, as on the Trinity that is, but we were, I've been, I was consistent from the start. I am not going to go back and waste my time proving this, you, you know, we can do it if we have to, but I was consistent from the start in recognizing the differences between the various people that were promoting protovisionism. And so 
when we did the sweater vest dialogue, I don't remember what the date was, but it wasn't all that long ago. Um, you know, I asked direct questions and it just seems from what I'm watching, I haven't seen anyone promoting federal visionism, but I've seen a huge explosion of how bad it is. And the only thing that triggered it evidently was Doug Wilson's appearance on national media where he said nothing that was even slightly related to federal visionism. And so when I, the, the, the couple of times that I've even interacted with somebody, I, I had a guy in, in one thread, uh, well, what happened was Kasi Hinn posted his stuff where he said, I've taken my tweets down and I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I'm contacting people. And then uh, he had a conversation with Doug Wilson and he posted, <laughs> I guess, I guess Doug took a screenshot and it had Costi's phone number. <laughs> and Doug's like, I guess I inadvertently doxed, um, a Costi cause he, he posted it and then they, everybody fixed it later on. But th that's, that's Doug. Doug's not the techie guy, uh, at all. And uh, he's not really comfortable with that stuff. But um, uh, he he had, put, uh, I think then Costi reposted it once it was, had his phone number removed. And there were people, and you know who you are, who re responded, man, I'm so sad to see this. You're, you're so sad to see someone talking with Doug Wilson, instead of having never spoken to Doug Wilson, condemning him and condemning his carnality. That was the terminology that had been used, his carnality. And I thought a lot about how I wanted to respond to it because the person who posted this is someone, I, again, I've preached at his church. I settled on simply posting sigh. Uh, I had to say something, but I decided not to go into it as far as I could have. And someone responded to that, just, I'm just so disappointed in you, and you don't refute anything here. And I'm like, what's there to refute? Costi Hinn posts that he's had a conversation with Doug Wilson. And someone says, I'm sad that you all talked. And I just go, what, what was I supposed to refute? Well, you should be joining us in uh, screaming about the federal vision. I said, well, I did that 20 years ago. Um, and all of this is based on this mindset that I've seen over and over again, just over the past few days. And that is, it doesn't matter what Doug said when I interviewed him, what he said in all sorts of stuff since then. Um, Rich mentioned a, and I only saw it go flying by at a at a gas station today, but um, a uh, some document from what nine years ago, I think, uh, where you know Doug was asked questions about justification and stuff like that, and it's again important material to have. And anyone who wants to be fair, balanced, truthful, uh, would think that those things are vitally important. But all I see is, but in 2002, this was said. Some of those people who actually read the entire book from which they're quoting, most have not. But the underlying necessary assumption that I'm seeing over and over again is, it doesn't matter what Doug says today, this is it. This is the only thing. And he's a liar. He's just a liar from beginning to end. Um, he, he is just a un untruthful, dishonest man. Now we know certain people who have a fatal case of DWDS, Doug Wilson derangement syndrome. Uh, we, we know who they are and uh, it's, it's amazing that they continue teaching their classes at seminaries, but, 
but it seems like for others, it's just like, in this one instance, we're not, we don't care what someone says. We, we are absolutely only going to accept the narrative um, that we would never apply to anybody else. But in this one instance, we're going to do it. And it's just, that's why I sigh. It, it, it's like, okay, you, you all do realize that if your church ever takes a stand on anything, you're going to end up with the examining Moscow type people, but they're going to be examining you. And if you know anything about life in the church, you know that it doesn't take you too many years until you got a whole cadre of those people. And you cannot defend yourself against certain accusations. You just can't. You, you would have to, you just have to go, nope, it's not how it happened, but uh, how it did happen, can't go into. Um, it's, it's not meant for public consumption and it would hurt too many people. And so only one side gets to make their case. And that's why we're, we're basically told there, there's a lot of violation of the biblical standards of witnesses in social media. If we applied God's law, you know, I've, I've, I've pointed this out because I think this is extremely important. Um, as we look at the advancement of technology, we, we as Christians should absolutely insist upon applying the standard of God's law. One thing, by the way, just in passing, I am really encouraged by the number of people I'm seeing who are getting that now. People who five years ago would never have thought of bringing God's law to bear upon the secular society get it now. They realize there's nothing else to bring to bear. Um, you know, I was really uh, impressed and thankful for John MacArthur's letter to Gavin Newsom. That's the church acting prophetically. But the only way to, to tell a rebel sinner he's a rebel sinner is to explain what God's law says about being a rebel sinner. That's bringing God's law, that's bringing theonomy against autonomy and saying autonomy is evil and will lead to your judgment before the throne of God on the last day. So the, the prophets, when they spoke prophetically, brought to bear God's law. Not, and, and people say, no, 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 that was just Moses' law just for Israel, which is why the minor prophets spoke to Non-Israelites. <laughs> when 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 uh, when Paul is is speaking with uh, Festus and Agrippa, and he's he's interacting with these leaders as he's been arrested and stuff like that, what do you think he's what do you think he's reasoning with them about? You think he's think he's just doing the Noahic covenant? <laughs> no, he's going to the scriptures. He's bringing God's law to bear, and we're talking about God's moral law. We're ta talking about the proper use of that law. We're not, we're not saying that he, you know, Paul wasn't telling these people that they uh, were under judgment because they had not, uh, because they had trimmed the corners of their beards. Okay. He's talking about the moral content of the law where God's law tells us, God made you and here's how you're to behave. Here's how you're to act. You're not to engage in sexual debauchery. Here's, here's the, Here's the parameters. Here's how God's law said God kicked these people out of the land of Israel. Gave the land to Israel. And then Israel got kicked out because violated the same laws, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am encouraged seeing all that. I am encouraged seeing, seeing all that happening right now. And it's, it's good. But anyway, uh, we will have to insist on the application of God's law in regards to witnesses. Because with the advancement of technology, one of the things that really concerns me is the ability now to do deep fakes, 
to create what looks like seamless evidence that someone did something. Um, if you've seen the uh, couple years ago on uh, America, uh, America's Got Talent, these guys did a deep fake of Simon Cowell and they brought this other singer out and then they ran their, they up on the big screen, they put their computer generated deep fake while the guy's singing of Simon. So it looks like Simon Cowell is up there singing. Uh, and it was very well done. And again, none of us have the technological capacity to be able to detect those things. And so as that gets better and better, um, people with power and money and technology can make you guilty of anything. Uh, they can get into your computer. We already know the government has gone into people's computers and put things on their computers to frame them. We already know they've done it. They're probably doing it today. And with the FBI the way it is today, oh, good grief. Um, so when someone says, well, here's a video of this, or here's, this, I just go, two or three witnesses, two or three witnesses. And of course, it should be two or three witnesses in the context where if the witnesses are found out to be dishonest, what they want to have happen or what could have happened to the accused will happen to them. That's God's law. Oh, but people could get away with stuff. Not eternally. Only in this life, which is a short life. The day of judgment is right around the corner. It's funny. We, we read the Psalter all the time. Don't we catch that stuff? It's everywhere. Read it. It's, 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 it's part and parcel of what it's all about to trust God. Yes, you see the evil. You grieve the evil. You, you get unjustly treated. But the day is coming. The day is coming. Um, so in the same way, we need to, it would be so wonderful if we applied those standards amongst Christians. You know, and every every generation is called to defend the truth, expose false teachers, but to do so graciously and without turning into judge, jury, and executioners ourselves. There is the problem. There is the problem. Um, fundamentalists fall off the cliff on one side. The liberals fall off the cliff on the other side. Liberals, there are no heretics. The fundamentalists, everybody but us is heretics. You get somewhere in the middle and you've got to find balance. And that involves massive Christian maturity. And obviously, uh, in my opinion, the... Uh, Social media does not encourage that level of maturity. Really, 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 really does not. And so I've been, I've been um, really disappointed in some of the stuff that I've been seeing when people were reacting to um, Kosti Hinn saying, I'm going to back off on this and I'm going to do my homework. As far as I could tell, Kosti Hinn has not said oh, I was wrong about all this stuff. He hasn't said that. And so there still could be something coming in a modified form, but hopefully a little more accurate, uh, a little more fair. But for some people, when it, when it comes to Doug Wilson, there's some people this is true about me, much more about Doug Wilson. Um, when it comes to him, there is no such thing as fair. Or can't be. And if anyone even asks for it, uh, you know, already so many of these these guys have, you know, just simply dismissed me. I've just been taken in, I've been fooled. <laughs> yeah, that's generally what I'm accused of, um, is is that 
um, by the, the the brilliant and deceptive Doug Wilson. You know, well, that's why I still want to schedule yet more debates with Doug in the future. Is because I'm just taken in. Obviously, I don't believe that the errors that I would, the things where we disagree with one another, uh, mean that Doug is not my brother in Christ. And that's the stiff. If, if these guys were, well, it's Omar, the guy that was on uh, NoCo Radio. He was straight up front. You know, Doug's a false teacher. He's not He's not a Christian. He's not a believer. You need to, need to go after him. Um, so there are those that are just straight up front. But I think most of us could see that and go, really? Um, okay. Drawing some pretty tight circles there. Uh, we know other people do that, but normally doesn't turn out too well. So anyway, um, everybody, everybody take a, you know, nice deep breath and um, try to remember biblical commands about being at peace and uh, grace and just ask, just, just remember someday you may need to have grace yourself in a public situation. And if you've extended it, you're probably much more likely to receive it. If you haven't, well, there you go. Um, I just saw um, Stephen Mel Melnison. You know, I've never talked to Stephen to know how to sp pronounce his last name. Uh, just posted a picture of Elf and it says just 12 Fridays left until Christmas. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Uh, real quickly, because I do, I do want to get something specific today um, that I think you'll find very interesting, especially those of you who like textual criticism, church history, Bible translation, issues like that again. Um, but uh, one of my students at... GBTS, David Hacker, posts a lot of really good stuff on uh, on Twitter. But I, I turned him on to Fulgentius of Rus. And um, I think he uses Logos. Are you using Logos to make these really nice? Because you've got I'm looking at one right now with, with Charles Spurgeon. And um, Logos has that sort of cool quote generator type thing. But I put um, I put a quote from Fulgentius up for him, and I think now a lot of my students are going, "Ooh, this guy is pretty cool." And he was, he was. Someday we'll have to do just do a show just on Fulgentian Fulgentius of Rus. Uh, but he's just a, an example of. The uneven development, positively and negatively, of tradition in church history. You can have bad examples of a departure from sound theology before and after examples of people who are very sound in their theology. It's not a straight line over the course of history. And so you can have, even in the same areas, some people that are just really edifying to read and others that are not edifying to read at all. And they, they were contemporaneous with one another. Well, how does that happen? Well, isn't that the case today? So <laughs> uh, I've used the illustration. What if, 3,000 years from now, they're digging up the remains of our culture and they come across a Christian bookstore. Can you imagine what they would, they would, what conclusions they would come to if they looked at what's in a Christian bookstore today? They would, they would have D. Martin Lloyd Jones next to John Calvin, next to the Puritans, next to Benny Hinn and word faith stuff and all sorts of wackiness and who knows what kind of conclusions they would come up to come up with as to what in the world we were doing uh, in, in our day. Uh, but you know, you've got 
super solid people today all over the place. Living, you've got churches today, spot on. You go half a block down and turn right, and you're going to have a church that is just loony. That's how it is. That's how it is. And that's been the case in uh, in history as well. And we, we it, w- it would be easier to have consistency today because we can, co- we can communicate so easily with one another and so quickly. They couldn't communicate quickly and easily uh, in those days at all. So anyway, I just, I just happened to see um, uh, that, that quote there from uh, David and then another one from Chris. Oh, this is great. The average price of a gallon of gas in Nevada continues to rise, skyrocketing by an average of 37.7 cents in a week. Oh, isn't it astonishing that the regime solely to try to get votes, solely to try to avoid the responsibility for their own purposeful destruction of our economy and indebtedness of our nation, um, that these folks would drain the strategic oil reserves to the lowest level ever, uh, endanger our armed forces and, and our nation's ability to respond to, say, terrorist attack or another man, what if another hurricane like Ian slammed into the oil refinery producing areas, something like that? We'd have nothing because these people are willing to use the treasures of our nation to get themselves elected. All they care about is power. They hate this nation and they hate the people of this nation and they will use them and abuse them. And they are, and we keep voting for them. It is just, it's judgment. It is simple common sense has been removed has been removed from people and we're, we're facing the results. So there you go. All right. I I fully understand the feeling because I experience it all the time of, well, look, uh, there's bad, 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 bad stuff happening. And there is. So, all we can talk about is the bad, 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 bad stuff. Well, bad, bad, bad stuff is happening everywhere. I mean, with, without exaggeration, it, I am not the only person. There are many really smart people, much smarter than me, who are sitting back going, it really seems like this regime is wants to see a nuclear war start. And you, you really are left stunned at the ineptitude. It's not ineptitude. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced it's not ineptitude. It's, it's purposeful destructiveness. But others might call it just ineptitude of the regime's handling of Ukraine and Russia and, and everything else. Um, and yeah, As I said on Twitter, you know, nukes start going off around the world. And if you if you have raised an entire generation of statists who believe that you don't pray to God, you pray to the state, you run to the state, the state is your savior. What are they going to do when nukes start going off? It won't take many. It won't take many. You don't have to have a terminator style global destruction you just take a few and the statists will run to the regime and will say take everything i own take every right i have just tell me you'll keep me safe now the very fact that you would trust the state to keep you safe is the sad part um you have a false god you got an idol but that's what they'll do. And we all get to be carried along for the ride when that happens. And um, a statism is a statism is, is, is a religious commitment. It's a religious commitment. It truly is. I think a lot of people are seeing that. Have I really been going for 40 minutes? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. 
I just looked at the clock on the screen. Uh, okay. Uh, now, I was sitting at dinner. Um, the second night of class. It's really, you know, one of the things that's neat about Grace Bible Theological Seminary is it's a church-based seminary. You know, that's what, you know, when it first started being mocked as strip mall seminary and stuff like that. It's it's based in a in a local church. And so the, the families of the church, they, they were bringing food in. Oh, they brought lasagna in for lunch. And uh, there was uh, there was some breakfast for us on Saturday. And they, they take care of these classes. It's really, really neat. And so we went over to someone's house. You may have seen the videos. We were we did some singing and I insisted they were only going to sing the first line, the first stanza of a mighty fortress. And I'm like, no, if you're reformed, you know, a mighty force, you know, all four stanzas, you have it memorized. If you don't, if you don't have that memorized, don't call yourself reformed. You're not. So we sang all four stanzas. Um, but uh, we went to someone's house. We sang and I was sitting there at dinner and the guy I was talking to, the student I was talking to, looked like Dr. Van Cleek, beard, stuff. And so he hadn't seen it. He had, he had only read about it. So I wanted to show him a picture. So I grabbed my phone and I Googled Peter Van Cleek. I was going to get an image. It ended up taking me to uh, standardsacredtext.com, his website. And instead of finding an image, I found out that Peter Van Cleek has been posting nastygrams since the debate completed uh, about yours truly. Now, I... The last program we did, I mentioned a couple of things. I think I mentioned that Dr. Van Cleek had very unwisely uh, done his opening. It was he was reading it. He was reading it very fast. Uh, he he made no effort to bring the audience along. He made no effort to explain things to the audience to to help them to understand what the importance of the issue was. Nothing. He just really rookie type mistakes that. I made when I first started doing debates as well. Um, Cause I didn't, who did you have to look to who were doing debates back then? He, he could have had lots of examples of how to do it right. But instead, you know, you're staying there, you're reading from a book, you've got these laminated pages, even the, your, your rebuttal is all prepared. Oh yeah. In other words, he did what Layton Flowers did. So it's the same thing. And the audience sees that they know you're not interacting meaningfully. That, that this is all just a shtick that you've got. And I think I mentioned also that he asked to do audiovisual. And so there's this bright white, he, he brings up the first screen he has, just a bright white screen. And so that's what's behind him. It's, it's almost blindingly bright. So it, it would be hard for people to even be looking at him, but he doesn't seem to notice. And I honestly thought maybe he had just forgotten. Maybe he was so nervous he forgot to start doing his slides or something. I don't know. That was all just to put up the one slide of the, the formula, the equation that he put up as his third argument um, that had absolutely nothing. No one has ever, ever used um, this theorem to... Decide textual readings. It's it's just amazing. Just an abuse of all this stuff. But anyhow, so I, I think I mentioned all that. And the main thing that I mentioned that I want people to understand was that Dr. Van Cleek had equated your belief in a particular textual platform with the same as being on the same as the same kind of belief as your belief in the resurrection which has massive implications, um, really massive implications. 
and that that did come out in in the debate. But I was like, you know, okay, we put it out there. Um, I saw some comments from some uh, some TR only guys uh, along the lines. You know, people like Chris Larson's and stuff. They they're gonna believe whatever they're they're gonna believe. Some some really nasty folks out there, um, but. I did see this. At least I hope I get to see this. Um, this morning, someone posted in our uh, a Alpha and Omega Ministries thing. Um, a fellow by the name of Peter, Peter Markavage. As much of an outsider that I am, as much as I came into the debate with a chip on my shoulder for Byzantine priority or functional KJV onlyism, I have to admit, James White won the debate, hands down. I'm not saying he's correct, but I'm not sure I'm correct either after listening. Also, he didn't devolve emotionally or academically, whereas Dr. Peter, God bless him, I'm sure he's a very holy guy, just seemed to devolve emotionally after the open, opening statement, almost as if he were mad about something. Well, a lot of people saw that, the, the you know, when you're making... When you're making uh, noises and faces and, oh, you know, this kind of stuff, people see that. And it, it weighs on their uh, interpretation of your position and, and things like that. So I had not had anyone come up to me and say, man, that was, man, he just, he really made me think about stuff. No one had said that to me. And the vast majority of the commentary from the people who were there, everything else was, wow, I hope he rethinks his position because that was really um, uneven. That didn't seem fair. But unlike uh, Dr. Van Fleek, who did declare himself the winner at the end of the debate, I, I'm, I'm happy to let other people come to that conclusion on their own. Uh, that's the best way to do it. So I wasn't really thinking about doing anything more until I started reading these blog posts that he's been putting up since the debate. And I'm like, there's some really good stuff in here. Good stuff as in, this is educational. This is, this, this is, it would be useful to address this. Part of it is just pure and ad hominem. I mean, it's, it's massive um, damage control after the fact. But he has a very, this is, you got to understand, the book that contained the primary element of the argumentation was self-published in June. June was not long ago. <laughs> so this is a minority view. It's an idiosyncratic view. I don't, I can't even attribute it to a large number of TR only guys because I don't think they even understand it yet. Uh, it, I don't know if they're going to try to, or just if they're going to find it to be so idiosyncratic that they can't really run with it. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but it's a teeny, 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 tiny group of, of people. And so when you start listening to this, it, it's just, okay. So, uh, let me just read you what he says here. Um, in studying Dr. White's method and approach to fellow Christians regarding the text and translation debate, coupled with the advice of others who knew Dr. White's teaching quite well, I was able to identify 30 or so proclivities which Dr. White regularly employed. So I'd assume he talked with Riddle and some of the other regular TR guys. I share these with you first and foremost as a help to those who may debate Dr. White in the future. He seems quite stuck in his ways. Well, if you don't give me any reason to think otherwise, then I will be. He seems quite stuck in his ways, and so his method and content is also stuck. Yeah, it's not been refuted by Bart Ehrman or you, so why should I change it? That probably means it's true. Okay. If you are aware of what he is apt to do, then you will be aware of his angles of attack. Lord willing, I'll share half today and then the other half tomorrow. In the context of the text and translation debate with Christians, Dr. White regularly does the following. Number one. He claims we have more manuscript evidence than ever before. This, of course, is an inscrutable claim. This is a term that he really likes to use, is inscrutable. 
There is no way we can know the evidence count in all places of ecclesiastical importance at all times of church history, and yet he will assert this claim with considerable but unfounded confidence. Dr. Van Cleek is not a historian. He does not understand history. He does not get it. Um, his horrible little booklet, uh, and then he poked the bear, um, demonstrate he's never done textual critical, and he says this is this is another thing where I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that one. It's, it's fairly early on. Um, but he's he's not done textual critical work, and he therefore he does not understand what the argument is. There has never been a time in history when you sitting in one location can have access to as much textual data as we have today, and that is not disputable. What he does not understand, we did not have the internet at any time until today. We did not have university libraries with um, a catalog system to where we know which manuscripts contain what. We did not have high digital, high quality digital pictures. You could not go find these things. There has never, ever been a time where Jerome or Origen or any of these men, men had access to even a small percentage of the information that we have access to today. That is a fact that cannot be questioned. Anyone the question that just demonstrates their own utter ignorance of history. Now, that's not to say that Jerome did not have access to manuscripts that we don't have. Duh, no one's disputing that. But he only had access to manuscripts in a particular area. There was no way for him to know what manuscripts were in Gaul what what any place else in around they did not have interlibrary loan they did not have library co collections that the stuff that we have access to today is completely unknown in church history that's just a fact that's what i'm talking about and when you compare the manuscript evidence available to us today to what Beza had, or Stephanus had, or Erasmus had. We know what they had. They've identified their manuscripts. There might be one or two or three that have, have been destroyed by fire, or like, like how the, the, one, the one manuscript of the Epistle to Diognetus was, was destroyed in the Franco-Prussian War uh, when they shelled a library and, and destroyed the, the, the manuscript. Okay, have there been losses like that? Yeah. That doesn't change the fact that they had a very, very small number of manuscripts available to them. And they, even if they, even if they were in a library that had a rich supply, they wouldn't know what was in the library on the other side of the hill. Because you didn't have the technological capacity to do so. Um, so uh, number one, refuted. Number two, knowing what the original originals originally said is a matter of evidence. Given number one, this claim is also unfounded because the totality of evidence available is only a fraction of the total amount of evidence which the church had over the centuries. Freeze frame. Uh, somebody, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that even the TR only guys will realize that Dr. Van Cleek functions on the dehistoricizing of terms like the church or the TR. These become concepts that just flit around in the mind. They no longer have a historical rootage anywhere. What church, who, what council, when, give names. As soon as you ask that, naturalist, naturalist. Okay, you say, you say, which the church had over the centuries. When did the church have manuscripts? What, what do you mean by that? How did they have them? Did they catalog them? Did they communicate them? Did they collate them? How do you know? You don't. You're just, you're just throwing out this terminology, the church, and you won't tell us who, when. And when everybody asks you to then define church, you get angry at them. That doesn't work. That is untenable. Continuing. Simply put, the vast majority of manuscript evidence has perished. No question about it. No question about it at all. But that has absolutely positively nothing to do with either the claim that I've made as to what is currently available to us in comparison to any other 
period in time. And secondly, you can't then assume what the content of that which has perished actually was. And unfortunately, he does when he talks about the TR. We only have a small fraction of the vast majority. Furthermore, from a merely evidential perspective, we do not have the originals. According to Dan Wallace, we wouldn't know we had the originals even if we had them. Um, I think we would, and I don't even know what he's talking about in regards to Dan Wallace. But part of his argument is that we do have the originals, and that's because the church has been given the scriptures. So we have the originals, and the original is the TR. The, the circular, circularity of it becomes very, very evident, uh, especially when you don't define your, your terms. But that's why he attacks textual criticism. And again, he's more, he is more skeptical than even Bart Ehrman. I mean, he used a lot of Bart Ehrman's arguments, but he is more skeptical than Bart Ehrman as to the ability of textual criticism to provide us with the original uh, language. But what it just doesn't understand is, you have to answer, why do we have such massive um, consistency in the manuscript tradition as a whole if it's not coming from an original source? If there were, if there were many different kinds of original texts, you would not have the kind of consistency that CBGM has demonstrated already to exist amongst the manuscripts as a whole. It... it explain how the wildly variant uh, original or early text just disappeared and left absolutely no trace in the manuscript history. 99% of all variants are scribal errors. They're not um, someone trying to, to fix some wildly variant reading. So it, it's just... It's frustrating because it's very clear he has never, ever struggled with texts. He's never done, he, he's never collate, collated a manuscript. He's never worked through difficult uh, variants, especially variants that aren't necessarily the popular ones, but some of the lesser known ones that can have four or five possibilities. He's just never done it. And so he can just make these massively skeptical statements that everybody who has done the work just goes, what are you talking about, man? Um, and he gets away with it. Number three, those who assume a theological grounding for determining what is scripture have no method. Notice the description. Those who assume a theological grounding for determining what is scripture have no method. Um, this is part of his, we're the theological ones, they're the naturalists. So you saw that coming up over and over again. And of course it's false. The issue is where you apply and how you apply. I, I believe scripture has been providentially preserved. How did that happen? And how then do we recognize that? Do I recognize that by prayer? Do I, when I'm, when I'm looking at, um, when, when I, uh, I preached a sermon, probably June, I think, of 2020 uh, on Romans 5.1. And there's a really important textual variant there. It's a one letter difference. The Omicron versus an Omega. Subjunctive versus the indicative. Ekomen, Ekonen. And I attempted to, in essence, explain what the difference between the two might be because the external evidence supports the subjunctive. The vast majority of textual critics have gone with the indicative. Um, so should you pray about that? Should everybody be, be taking, I don't know, their Bible, their Bible's not going to tell them about it. Come think of it, but taking a Greek new Testament and, and praying about it, maybe you should have a prayer circle. You know, how do you, how exactly does this work? When you, when you talk about sanctification and the spirit of God, uh, how does that work? Um, he gives us, so, so he wants to, what he wants to do is paint their side. We're theological, they're naturalists. That's baloney. Absolute pure. You, you, you really know your position is weak when you have to engage in this kind of argumentation. 
He says, this is patently false. We do have a method, and it includes evidences, particularly background, prior, and posteriori evidence. No, they don't. They do not have a method because they reject doing textual criticism. And when I say a method, I mean a method of determining what the readings are. They have no method. It's just whatever the TR says. That's not a method. That is elevating the TR out of history into something that it's, that if Erasmus, if, <laughs> I, I would love to see Erasmus come back from the dead and have this method explained to him and just watch his face. He would, Stephanus, Beza, they'd all just go, what is this guy talking about? We don't have a clue. Um, they, the fact of the matter is these men, if they were handed the entire New Testament manuscript tradition we have today, could not produce the TR because the TR was not produced by a single individual or application of a single methodology. That's why TR only guys, they'll, ar they'll argue one set of arguments for this one and another set of arguments there, and another set of arguments there. And if those arguments contradict each other, they don't care. That's why it's incoherent. It's indefensible. Can't be used in apologetics. It's incoherent. Um, he says, um, our method is first and foremost, the spirit, word, faith paradigm or the Spirit of God speaking through the words words of God, the people of God, who then receive God's words by faith. That is gibberish when applied to a textual variant. So let's apply this, because that's that, that sounds so theological. Sounds so, oh, that sounds great. Because it's speaking of overarching issues. It's speaking of the relationship of the Spirit and the Word. But the people who, when you read Calvin saying that, Calvin then did not go to a textual variant and say we should pray about it. Okay, that's where that's where what Van Cleek does is he takes stuff that Christian scholars say about stuff out here, category errors, rams it over here, and makes applications that they never made because they knew it was an invalid application. They recognized that. They didn't follow, they didn't, well, they didn't even think about going this direction. Only he's thought about going this direction. And to say, well, we have the spirit. The spirit's not a method. The spirit's not a method. Um, so we continue on. Because I want to get to at least one of these. I don't want to go all night. Um, but um, those who assume a theological grounding for determining what is scripture, again, this is his new description for his own little, very tiny little group, um, believe the evidence is irrelevant. This is also patently false. No, it's not. I'll give you an obvious example. Um, the ECM of John's going to come out pretty soon, I hope. In fact, I have to wonder if it hasn't come out and I missed it. Um, hope not. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this. But let's say the ECM of John uh, adds further evidence and testimony to the, to the most ancient reading of John 1.18, monogenes theos, where Jesus is called God, over against monogenes theos, which is what is in the Texas Receptus. Um, will that evidence be relevant, Dr. Van Cleef? Answer, no. And this, they prove themselves. The same thing is true with Dr. Riddle here. Nothing that has been discovered since 1644 can possibly be relevant because they've identified the TR as the original. If it says the same thing as the TR, big deal. If it says anything different than the TR, it's wrong. It can't be relevant. It doesn't matter. CBGM doesn't matter. Papyri doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. We believe the evidence has much relevance in apologetics. How can it have relevance in apologetics if what you're using is the TR as the infallible, inspired, inerrant original? That's no different than what the Muslims do when they go, well, hey, if we can get back to Uthman, good enough for me. That's what happened when I debated Adnan Rashid, and he gets all upset when I mention them. 
well, sorry, I've been doing this since you were a kid. And so I can draw from my experience in dealing with these issues and in taking this stuff into places you've never taken it to, and you never could. You never could. I, I cannot imagine what would happen if you tried to take your theory into a mosque against a well-read Muslim opponent. I, I ask you, don't. For the sake of everybody, don't do it. Apologetics, history, archaeology, linguistics, etc. But it has almost no authority to determine what is and what is not a word of God. There you go. If it has no authority to determine what the apostles originally wrote, then it's irrelevant, isn't it? Either that or apologetics, history, archaeology, and linguistics is somehow disconnected from what is and what is not a word of God. That might be a that might be an issue. Uh, those who assume a theological grounding for determining what is scripture, in other words, us TR only guys, are ahistorical because they can't account for pre-TR eras. We do account for pre-TR eras through a distinction between preservation of the words of God in general, Christian belief in history, and the preservation of the words of God between two covers. What? That's why I say, take this out of the teeny tiny little Facebook groups where it's being promulgated. Bring it out into the real world. Take that onto a university campus. Take that up against Ehrman. Take that up against anybody. And it's going to collapse like the house of cards that it is. That doesn't, and, and what do you mean the word of God between two covers? This comes up a number of times, between two covers. Um, almost no one at the Council of Nicaea had a Bible between two covers. Almost nobody. The, the earliest examples we have come from that time period where you finally, it, it, it cost in modern day money, you know, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. But the vast majority of Christians, the vast majority of believers in God through, the, 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 through history, never had scripture between two covers. The Jews didn't. They had the seat of Moses. They had the scrolls in the synagogue. They didn't have anything between two covers. 99% of all Christians lived up until the Reformation without nothing with two covers. It's just an anachronism. It just doesn't understand history. And it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I mean, there's no explanation. Uh, we do account for pre-TR eras through a distinction between preservation of the words of God in general. What does that mean? Word of God, words of God in general. Because see, I asked him, where is the TR in the first century? Where is it in the second? Where is it in the third? I we don't, we can't, can't, I can't answer that. Can't answer that. Yeah, it's just natural, wrong, wrong question. No, it's the right question that his theory has absolutely no meaningful answers to. Not that can actually answer questions. If you buy all of his redefinition of stuff, and well, if you put this together with that and that to that and that, um, like I said, end of apologetics. TR advocates are basically or functionally KJV only. This, of course, is an emotional play to get the audience to feel poorly about our position. No, it's not. Dr. Mark Ward has demonstrated, I think, very clearly. And in my experience, it's real simple. Ask these guys, show me a place in the King James that can be translated better than it is. And as soon as you do that, now, if someone will say, well, you know, uh, you know, I think they should, they, they should have accurately translated the Granville Sharp instructions or some long old lines. Great. I'd like to hear you do it. Show me. But if you're making the King, and he is, he does this. The whole thing is English, stand, you know, making the King James the standard English text. Um, the guy's King James only. Is he different than Peter Ruckman? Thank goodness. But doesn't change the fact. Uh, it's not an emotional play. It's emotional manip manipulation at its best. Nope, it's just observation of the facts. A reasonable analysis of our position would show the conflation of confessional bibliology with KJV onlyism to be unwarranted. No, nope, it's quite warranted. Number seven, TR advocates cannot do apologetics. Here, this of course is a silly claim. Watch, simply take a look at the Protestant scholastics who regularly did apologetics against the Roman Catholic apologists of their day, and in fact were victorious. 
don't you dare claim them for your own. I know you try to, but I'm here to tell you they're not yours. They did not have what we have today to assume that they would even give the slightest attention to your theory is astonishing. King James translators didn't believe that. Rasmus didn't believe that. Beza didn't believe that. They did not adopt your perspective. You're taking stuff they said on issues like canon and transferring it over to text that they themselves recognize why in the world would Turretin would even have falsely, he just didn't know, falsely have said that the large majority of the Greek manuscripts contain the Kama Yohannian. He was wrong about that, but why would he even say that if majority text versus major minority text wasn't an issue? Um, so CR advocates can't do apologetics and to try to go, well, look, this Protestant scholastics did is to demonstrate again, a complete disconnection with history, disconnection with what they had, how they knew what they had, what they didn't know at the time. It's a complete disconnection from history. This claim is practically and historically false. Just the opposite is true. What is more, it seems Dr. White is nearly identical with that of Dr. Ehrman, though they each conclude differently. It is hard to claim you do apologetics when you agree with your interlocutor on everything except the conclusion. The reality is that the uh, skepticism that Dr. Van Cleet expresses toward textual criticism is the same skepticism Dr. Ehrman has. He's the one who unknowingly, I would assume, uh, agrees with Ehrman, not me. Uh, Dr. White is prone to offer the same old stale, dead arguments. This makes him very predictable. Never underestimate your debate opponent, but in this case, the probability that Dr. White is going to make the same lame arguments he has for years is very high. The only problem is neither you nor anybody else has refuted those arguments. And in fact, they have refuted the positions that I was debating. So why would I... They, when you say it, it's amazing for someone who's claiming that a 16th century Greek text is what we should be using to call something stale. Um, <laughs> that there's a, there's, a, there's a real confusion on your part there, uh, Dr. Van Cleek. It really, really is. But, I'm, but I, I will take this as a compliment that, yes, I remain very consistent. Why would I change if my positions haven't been refuted? You certainly didn't at all. The cross-examination demonstrated that it was rather easy for me to respond to any serious questions and then demonstrate how many of those questions weren't serious at all. Dr. White regularly, okay, here we go. This is the one I wanted to get to, it's number nine. Dr. White regularly pulls the have you ever done textual criticism line in order to attack his interlocutor's ethos or credibility in discussing these topics. Now listen to this. This this is one of the greatest examples I've, I've ever seen of someone helping me to make my case. It really is. In the end, this is the same dumb tactic used by abortion advocates who claim that unless you have a uterus, you can't have an authoritative position on abortion. Think about that one a second. Think about that one a second. Because you see, when we hear people today uh, making that kind of silly argument, we recognize how absurd it is because what it's saying is you have to have a particular um, bodily organ to have an opinion on the morality of the murder of unborn children. And that's really, I would say the only bodily organ you really need to have is a brain, not a uterus. But he's, make, he's paralleling having a uterus with actually having done textual criticism. Here's, here's what it should have been. Um, my argument is that if you're going to argue about how to do an abortion, you better be medically trained and have experience in doing so. See, that would have been the rational connection. We're not talking about the morality of abortion. 
if you're going to make specific claims about how abortions are done and how to do them effectively, you need to be trained in that area and know something about the procedures. Um, if you want to argue about doing cardiac ablation, um, when I had cardiac ablation done, my cardiologist had done thousands of those procedures. Had nothing to do with taking a moral position on something. And so we're talking about doing textual criticism. And we're talking about the results of textual criticism. We're talking about analyzing readings. And yeah, if you've never done that, then your opinion is pretty much irrelevant. It really is. And the skepticism, the, the reason that Dr. Van Gleek made the face plantingly bad arguments that he did in his book is because he doesn't do it. And so he can make claims and those that do it sit there and go, uh, dude, what? But he doesn't get it and he doesn't care to get it because he doesn't do textual criticism. And so he, he could have made an argument if he had made the right connections, but instead by making the connections he does, just that's embarrassing. But it does demonstrate that he really struggles to see categories and to see how things relate to one another in, in doing the practice of textual criticism, history, things like that. That was that was a that was a big one. Let's at least do the first 10, uh, shall we? Because I, I mean, I, I'll go through the rest of them. And they're, they're, I know there's lots of other stuff to be looking at, but sometimes it gets a little repetitive. Let's at least do the first 10 and then we'll we'll call it good for the day. Dr. Y is apt to say most scholars believe X. This is called the bandwagon fallacy simply because most scholars believe X doesn't make X right or true. Most of the pre-Civil War South believes slavery was good, but that didn't make slavery right. Most of the religious leaders of Jesus' day replaced Je rejected Jesus, but that doesn't excuse their murder of Christ or make their position any more right or true. Okay, a couple things. I very rarely do that. Um, and in fact, have criticized that over and over again. I have, for example, a long history of criticizing the... Um, basic facts argumentation in apologetics. Uh, most scholars believe Jesus rose from the dead type argumentation. I have criticized that for a long time. Um, when it comes to the textual critical area, there are fundamental areas of agreement where most scholars agree. And I don't make that as the, the argument. I simply make it as here is what scholars say and it consistently works. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, CBGM recently has been this is an opportunity to test the conclusions we've come to in the past uh, by a, a, a pretty objective methodology. And so far, the changes have been very minor uh, as a result, which, which basically says they haven't done a bad job in the past. Um, so... Yes, if you were to constantly be using the, mo the most scholars argu argument, that would be the bandwagon fallacy, uh, but that's not where I was going with, uh, with any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll pick up with these because it is good to be able to, uh, what, this, what this is allowing us to do is to analyze uh, our error, Errors in argumentation, even from Christians, even from believers, especially in this context, because Dr. Van Cleek's argument is the more sanctified you are, the more you're going to agree with him. And here's a good example of where actually sanctification should lead us to a recognition of his own errors. If you're being sanctified in thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, but it's just, it's helpful these days when the world specializes in muddled thought to be forced to think through things, to, to, to create clear categories, clear connections, proper progressions, to think about the role of history, theology, put, put all of this together. Sometimes it just gets so maddening um, listening to media even listening to Christians 
that we just wanted to turn it all off and run, run, run screaming into the into the night. Uh, it's helpful to sometimes lay everything aside, focus on one thing, and see lo how logic works, see how argumentation works, uh, and recognize fundamental errors that are being made. Um, and that's the only reason I want to go through this stuff. I mean, the one that one was sort of, I thought was extremely helpful to point out where it's just such a clear error of thought. Uh, to, to make the connection between the abortion argument and the fact that we're talking about the result of textual criticism. And, and these guys reject that. You know, I, I gave the reference to the Krenz book um, that goes through Erasmus's own words as to how he came to textual critical conclusions. And he used a textual critical process. That is the historical um, genesis of the TR. These guys have to ignore that. They cannot deal with that. Because as long as they say, well, we can't recreate the text, or the church does this. Was Erasmus the church? If Erasmus is the church, then we know what the church is now, don't we? He was a Roman Catholic priest. Um, that really uh, helps to demonstrate just the, the vacuous nature of this traditionalist movement. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue uh, pressing forward on this. There's, I think there's 30 of them. So we're, we're a third of the way through. So we'll, we'll throw them in. If, you know, other stuff can come up, that'd be more important and we don't, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's useful to, to look at this type of stuff. And even on the second, the second one has a bingo card and stuff like that. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ad hominem, uh, stupid, stale, you know, and he was he was getting abusive during the debate. Again, when your position's lost, that's what happens. And and in his case, you know, this is his whole thing. This is all he's done. This is this is his thing. And so if it falls apart, then everything he's done so far falls apart. And I get the desperation that comes as a result of that. It's it's I get it. It's it's an emotional thing. Uh, but there you go. Okay. All right. That will, uh, that will do it for, for now. I, um, I, I, I don't think tomorrow is going to work. Um, only because it's a long leg. It's, uh, many hours in the saddle. Um, but hopefully, um, the day after that will, because it's be a short one and should be able to get another program in at that point. And uh, so we will we will move on. And like I said, I will have had at least one conversation that's relevant to uh, certain topics right now by then. So hopefully I'll be able to um, report on that. Um, if it's relevant, if it's not, we won't even talk about it, but we'll go from there. So uh, once again, thank you very much for those of you who make this uh, possible, uh, this whole whole trip. I've got another trip coming up in late November, early December, St. Charles going to be in um, East Texas uh, as well. Going to contact a, a brother in more West Texas to see if they want to do something on the way out. Um, then we've got another one coming up, Lord willing, in uh, February and one in May. So uh, if we, if we do make the decision to try to make the change, we'll obviously let everybody know. And, and look, we understand. Uh, Rich was telling me that reports in Phoenix are the, the inflation rate in Phoenix is not eight something. It's 13 something. It's just, it's just absurd. Um, especially it's so frustrating when you, you know, you know the regime's doing it on purpose, and then they pretend like it's not even happening. It's it's um, it's exactly how they did it in the Soviet Union, and they're just doing it again. It's the same old playbook. But anyway, all righty. Um, I, I did. Oh, um, I, I at some point we're going to have to do a non YouTube one that won't go up on YouTube because more and more is coming out demonstrating that 
all of you who were telling us we were conspiracy theorists and we were irresponsible and everything else, the data is piling up. Um, and we'll have to talk about some of that stuff in the um, in the future as well. It's a little bit easier to do in the regular studio than here in the in the back of of our unit. But anyways, thanks for watching the program today. We will see you next time on the dividing line. God bless.